uh, for this wonderful and then um, the R1 is not <laughs> yet. <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for the encouragement. Uh, I'm really encouraged. Um, so I have to tell you the story uh, about how the Dulikate Heart Study began. When I started my, pro my um, I, st I actually joined for an MPH in epidemiology program at, at the University of Washington. And I, I had, actually I had no interest in cardiovascular. It was 2010. So I was uh, all my life, uh, whatever, I was pretty young then, but whatever professional life I had, I had all, all like worked only in master uh, in MCH program, maternal child health, and I was very passionate about um, about it. When I uh, when I landed in the in UW, um, I was like torn apart because there was no MCH global MCH program, and then I had to choose between doing MCH in US or anything that is available in Nepal. So I chose anything that is available in Nepal. I bumped into a net in our SPH. Um, there, there used to be like, I don't know if it is still existing. There used to be a faculty uh, student interaction uh, expo in a uh, school of public health and where I bumped into um, a net and then she had this poster on uh, cardiovascular research that she had recently done in Nepal. It was uh, in a small sample. And I used that for my thesis. And that's how my career in CVD research began. And I'm still stuck to it. Uh, uh, so I was like really impressed with what Alfred has been doing, uh, which uh, now recently I am extending my um, research area into the maternal child health and CVD intersection. That was going to be really uh, neat. Um, so when we so when we were so Buras came in after after a year and then I had not faced any tornado like that before. <laughs> so he was he comes in and he has always big plans. So if any of you has known and then we were talking about so I had just analyzed uh, food um, uh, um, data in the small study and then we were trying to expand it to a larger study and then Buras comes and it was it, well, it was actually his idea to do a cohort study and he says, let's do a cohort study and then we'll call it duplicate heart study, just like Framingham heart study. And I was like, you are, don't talk to me ever <laughs> because I want to finish my dissertation. I don't want to start any cohort study right now. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think we both are really grateful to Annette for believing in us because we were like first year <laughs> A PhD student, and then we uh, we both went to Annette with this idea. We want to start the study that will eventually be a cohort study, and she immediately bought us. And now I realize it was hard, Annette, for uh, for you at that time, because uh, I didn't have context till then. Now I have so many students <laughs> who come to me with all these big ideas, and I'm like, okay, Annette did that to us, so let's uh, let's do it. So that's how the story of the Heart Study began. Um, and then we had, uh, so Biraz and I, actually I developed this long-term professional uh, relationship and then wonderful friendship because of this study uh, as well. So uh, this is very special in our uh, life. Um, so I'll start with the introduction. So I'm not going to um, like talk a lot about why is it important because we all know that the CVD has been a very instrumental health issues in uh, uh, worldwide and it impacts a lot of uh, lives all, around, all over the world. Uh, in 2010, when we uh, started, we were thinking about the study. There was no publications from Nepal yet, even not reporting the hypertension prevalence. So it was very new concept at that time. There was one study that talked about trends in cardiovascular health in Nepal, and it was an opinion paper. So I, I think this was the one of the first um, CVD-related studies uh, that were initiated in Nepal. So we uh, started this in November, November of 2013 and our cohort study to understand CVD epidemiology and its risk factor in Nepal. And uh, so we are like 13 years, uh, almost like 10 years and 13 years since the incep uh, incep uh, inception of the study. So I was pretty new at that time in, in the context of Nepal. And we have been taking all of these epi and CVD classes and only learning about all of these data and issues from uh, and like uh, mostly uh, nurses health study and health professional service, CHS, MESA, uh, none we had heard from LMIC at that time. 
Uh, so the main uh, objective was to gain an in-depth understanding of CVD epidemiology and its risk factors among urban Nepalese uh, population. We wanted to look at uh, mortality, um, esti estimate mortality rates for NCD and more estimate the prevalence and incidence rate for major NCDs. And we um, we started with like CVD, but we also like uh, integrated more mental health and cognitive uh, functions um, into it. Uh, and then we were looking at both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. This is only the limited number of risk factors that I've put in the slides. Um, and then we are continuously expanding. Um, this is uh, this was conceptualized as a longitudinal prospective cohort study. Uh, thanks to Viras <laughs> for this. Uh, in the Tbilisi municipality and planned for uh, follow up every five years for twenty years follow up of the participant. And note that we didn't have any funding at that time <laughs> when we started uh, vision and, and we had this big vision. But then we were able to get some funding over the time for the study. Um, but then we were we got bombed with all of these natural calamities when we wanted when we were planning our first uh, follow up uh, into 2015. We had an earthquake, uh, so we had to like push that agenda. And then finally in 2018, we actually even hired a study coordinator to do the follow up. And then the COVID came in, and then we had to stop it again. So soon after uh, COVID, um, uh, we then and then that study coordinator left uh, with two other job. Uh, and then um, soon after the COVID, we were able to uh, restart uh, enrolling uh, people into it and then started the following up our uh, cohort that we started in 2013. Um, the the study population were all the residents who were 18 years and older uh, living in the local municipality. At that time, we were estimating about 9,000 uh, people, um, and uh, they had to be 18 years or older, permanent residents of the Tulikil, and living in the Tulikil for at least six months prior to the enrollment. Uh, we excluded everyone who was living in institutional setting like hostels and models because they, this is a university um, area. So there are a lot of students who are coming in, staying there for four or five years and then moving out. We were we excluded those. Um, also, we had to exclude the mentally challenged and those who were not able to respond in the study and those who were pregnant at that time. Um, we all of the data collection happened in person, uh, and we used red cap uh, for that. And we also did anthropometric measurement. We did blood pressure measurement, blood sugar lipid measurement of a subset. We had uh, blood taken for about about five hundred and fifty people, and we have saved that. <laughs> We have frozen it. So anybody who wants to do a research in Nepal, we have a blood sample frozen uh, among our subset. Um, and then we used multiple questionnaires like socioeconomic status. Uh, we used global physical activity questionnaires, uh, food frequency questionnaire that we developed together for the Nepali context. Uh, there was no any tool available to measure food at that time in, in Nepal. And um, now a lot of researchers have used this, this FFQ that we developed uh, and validated. Uh, we measure medical history, MMSC, digit spam, uh, substitution task tests, perceived stress, uh, we did PHQ-9. We also did uh, CSED in our first wave, actually. Uh, and then we also have a social support instrument uh, knowledge uh, and then other um, women uh, reproductive health related uh, variables. Uh, we measured height, weight, percent body fat of our of subset population, waist and hip circumference, uh, blood pressure, and then lab test for uh, about half of the people that we enrolled in the first wave. Uh, so recruitment happened house to house contact uh, in house. So initially what we did was we enumerated all of the households in the municipality. Uh, and then because we were also under pressure to finish our dissertation in, in, in a certain given time, uh, the first enrollment for the first enrollment, we randomly selected a third of the household population. And then we went to each of these household to enroll the participants. So the research assistants will, will go to each household. Actually, we have a GPS location of all of the households uh, 
from 2013. Of course, now it has uh, grown a little bit, but we do have that information. Uh, and then uh, we and the research assistant uh, took the recent written informed consent because there is a lot of illiterate population. We also did uh, informed consent in presence of a witness and the witness would sign uh, and then um, participant will give the verbal, verbal consent. We recruited about uh, uh, 1,078 participate in 2013 and that was the base for both of us both of our dissertation um and then we have we have been recruiting since uh, 2022 so we have recruited additional 903 participants uh, like 15 days until 15 days before this today so and then the enrollment is ongoing so we are recruiting like about uh, uh, eight to 10 participants every day. It is pretty in intensive because we have to go to every household. Interview is about two hours long. And when you talk to Nepalese people, it is very difficult to wrap anything in two hours. <laughs> so the interview can kind of keep going. So one person is only able to get at least two or three interview per day. Um, and then this is the characteristics of our participants. Uh, in the baseline, you can see that this is a representative of the whole community because the, the sample was random. Um, uh, about um, the um, average age was about 40 years. Uh, and now the, they have turned, uh, and then we have followed up 314 people so far, and now they are 10 years older, of course. Uh, but the new wave is also on an average 44 years old. Uh, major ethnicity is Newar because that community is predominantly a Newar community. It's a specific um, ethnicity in uh, uh, in certain parts of Nepal. Uh, Dulikeli is one, and Kathmandu is another, uh, where um, they both me and Biraz are Newars. Rashmi and Pramita too, not these two. Um, uh, so you can see that about about a third of population didn't have any formal education. Mean years of education was only 6.6 years. Um, and looking at annual income, uh, this is of the participants, uh, about like 8,873. And then uh, in the follow-up, uh, this has increased significantly, I guess also because, uh, because of the mean age has also increased. So many of them are now in uh, employment. Uh, the new recruitment in the new rec uh, wave two, new recruitment, uh, the mean um, annual income is uh, nine, about $950. Um, most of them are married. And most of them uh, are Hindu, which is quite representative of the country. Like most of the country would represent them, like identify themselves as a Hindu. So these are some of the early publications that we did from our uh, first wave. Um, uh, we published a lot on hypertension, tobacco, like we did uh, awareness treatment and control of hypertension in Nepal, uh, pre-hypertension and its risk factor. Uh, we also did the food patterns, uh, food analysis and its association with obesity and uh, hypertension and diabetes in, in the country. Actually, it was very interesting because we had this hypothesis that the traditional Nepalese diet would be good because we are in general think that the fast food uh, and the sugar sweetened beverages are bad and traditional food are good. But it's like surprisingly what we found was uh, traditional diet was associated with uh, diabetes in our population. And it was because of the huge amount of uh, rice that we were using and we did when we did the food pattern analysis we found that rice uh, eaten with uh, tobacco uh, sorry alcohol and meat was the culprit um, and then we also uh, published the cardiovascular risk factors and memory functions in Nepal um, uh, again about the correlates of uh, tobacco and then uh, quit intentions and attempt to quit among smokers. Um, uh, we also did a small qualitative uh, component into that, looking at the facilitators and barriers to treatment uh, of hypertension among the patients who were diagnosed, newly diagnosed with hypertension. Uh, and then prevalence and risk factor of depressive symptoms among uh, Nepal. And then we are still um, working on more uh, publications out of that data. Um, talking about the current research training embedded in DHS. So now DHS has become, since we have started, restarted uh, following up the people and then also enrolling new uh, participants in the study. 
uh, a couple uh, quite some studies have been already planned uh, who that are using the, these data. Uh, so this this is the overview of uh, who is gonna use uh, this data. So uh, Christina Park, she's also our um, uh, she's also a PhD student from the University of Washington, and that is the primary mentor. She's looking at the longitudinal risk factors and outcomes associated with blood pressure metrics in Nepal. So uh, she is also like, we are in the new cohort, we are also collecting the blood pressure variation within seven days and how it is really related to the cognitive functions. Um, Dr. Rajendra, who is a PhD student from Nepal, he is uh, also like doing a small pilot study among the subset. Uh, uh, and looking at uh, uh, salt reduction. Um, Prabhita is planning to use this data, look at the universal co health coverage and CVD in Nepal. Uh, we have another student from our university, Pushpa, who is looking at, oops, sorry. She's looking at social support and quality of life uh, among um, hypertensive Neha and Biraz is already is graduating. She you will uh, hear their presentation tomorrow. Uh, Neha looked at nutrition transition from 2012 to 2022, 10 years nutrition transition, and um, how did it affect the BMI uh, in the Tulikat Heart Study participants. Biraz has also looked at cardiovascular metabolic risk factors among rural and non-rural adults. So he used uh, rural ad uh, non-rural adults. Um, participants from Dulikil compared it with another study uh, that used rural participants. Rashmi is gonna use social determinants and control of hypertension um, among participants of DHS. And uh, we have another student in our university who's gonna use, uh, look at pesticide use and hypertension in this study. So yeah, it's uh, pretty comprehensive. And I didn't mention one, one of the Yale students, she had just analyzed the, the data for her thesis. She looked at uh, parity and uh, um, BMI among female participant, and there was a very significant association between parity and BMI. This is the research stream at the ground. And I should mention, Pramita was the first study coordinator. <laughs> Uh, without who we would not have graduated <laughs> at all. And she took care of all of the data collection at Crown. Uh, and thank you so much. So everybody, we think we have about five minutes. Um, do we have any questions for Archana? No, he's not going to bump you. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Arjuna. Uh, so I had a question about the education status. I was a little surprised to see that large percent, 30 some odd percent with no formal education. That because, it's not something we're used to seeing. Yeah, the, I think uh, our average age was 40 years and education has been, uh, it's much better now. But then with that population, it, there is still like about one third have not been to school at all. Okay, that was good. And then my other question was, when you started talking about the numbers you expected, I think you said 9,000, and then you had enrolled 1,000. Do you have information on yeah. the numbers who declined? And I know this is a challenge for all of our studies. Hey, so, are they the same or different? So nobody, it is very crazy thing. Nobody declines in Nepal. So we had a very... Actually, in my dissertation defense, I had very hard time to convince like the opponents. <laughs> yeah, people are don't decline. So, uh, nine thousand was the total population in the area that we were uh, we were expecting, and we were only planning to enroll about thirty percent of them in the first wave. But we had to like graduate and. We stopped at one year of data collection, so we ended up enrolling yeah. 2017. No, uh, nobody declines. It's, I think it's just Nepali culture. Like as a researcher, we have to understand, like they don't say no, but they would not show up in the appointment and, <laughs> and they would not say no. No passive aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. But then now here we were going to their house and then talking to their, even like feed snacks and tea to our research yeah. friends. And, yeah, it's a very different culture. 
I was going to mention in terms of education, we have the no formal education. There was a category both on Nihan Baraj's educational cross tabulations. It, what is informal education? Because it's different than, you know, grade school, high school, some college. It's informal education. So when we, in Nepal, like because the literacy rate was so high, government came up this informal program. It was called adult literacy program. So a lot of adults who had never been to school could enroll in this evening classes and they would learn like maybe up to a primary grade. Uh, and they, they could um, mostly like just reading and um, writing in Nepali. So that we call as informal education. Um. Since I have the mic, I'll start here. Um, fabulous presentation. I really like the way you you gave us an overall sense of what's going on and some of the studies that are happening. And you know, a huge congratulations to you and Baraj for making this. I mean, this is incredibly unusual worldwide. A um, couple of questions. One, I mean, well, one comment is that um, the kinds of information you're collecting uh, includes an amazing amount of stuff around the social determinants. Yeah. Is, is, and I didn't realize that uh, until I was looking at your slide. And so it does seem that you could, you know, there are just huge numbers of things that you can do um, in addition to what you're doing already mm -hmm. that um, I suspect, you know, some of your Rajni and others are talking about. My question is a little bit along the lines of what uh, Carrie asked, but slightly from a different perspective, which is that um, you started with about a thousand, you know, mm -hmm. in 2013, a little over 1100, and then your follow up was 300 or, or so, 314. Mm -hmm. So that's about 30 ish percent. Um, do you have a sense uh, for what the follow up, uh, the, the reasons for loss to follow up, the proportion that you, uh, presumably the follow up? the actual follow-up probably includes deaths, right? And so loss of follow-up is you don't know. So the question is, you probably can figure out the reasons by looking at the characteristics of those people who didn't follow up. So do you have an idea of the reasons for follow-up, loss of follow-up? And then secondly, how does your follow-up compare to say the Framingham art study? Uh, because it's always very hard to follow up people, you know, and my guess is it's a lot easier in Framingham than it is in Dulekill. So just kind of curious about your follow up challenges. Yeah, so it has been challenging. So the first effort that we made in the follow up was we are still still following up. So this is not the end number. Um, so we called all of the participants uh, that we had phone number from 2013 and uh, most of those we could not contact it because the number is not working right now. So the, our second strategy is to now use our GPS location and go to the household. So we have not done that yet. So that's why I'm saying it's not the um, end number. So we are hoping, so we have not been able to contact other people through telephone only right now, but now we are going to the locality. Yeah. Actually, I don't know about the framing hands. Well, I could CHS because I was involved in CHS, um, which is four sites in the United States. Because we always got a proxy person who knew the person when we couldn't contact them, we had someone else to call. But we were about, we you know, 80, 85%, even over 20 years. Uh, we recruited in 1989-90, and we still are people over age 65, and we still have about 100 that are still living. And um, it's so much easier in the United States. And I do think it's the ability to find them. Mm -hmm. They, You just couldn't find them. It's just we, the phone number was not working. So we are now, we need to go to the household. Are we yeah, using Yeah, 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 yeah. I think they will find more. Yeah. I know I, they will. I am very hopeful, yeah. She's persistent. <laughs> and then we also have, as Annette said, we also have uh, phone numbers of three proxies that we haven't uh, called them yet. Because we just started like nine months ago uh, to new enrollment and follow up. So we are on our way. You guys want to ask. And then we have to get Nana started on her presentation. 
So uh, just a quick question and comment. First of all, a testament, you know, to you're never too young to do great things. You know, you started as as PhD students and uh, look what you guys have uh, accomplished, especially when you have great mentors. Um, just a curiosity. Uh, I noticed that the people you followed up and I know the reason big reason you haven't followed up is you just got this started. You've started with just phone phone calls, etc. But it was really interesting that the people who successfully followed up, their annual income is like 2000 something, yeah, yeah. as opposed to 700. What's up with because that? I think it's truncated. And now we have these people starting from 28 years old, because in, when they were enrolled, they were like, the I think it's going to be short. Youngest was 18 years old. Now we have youngest who is 28 years old. So that might be the way. So it's uh, just a comment from my side. So when the Dulgilal study was conceived and started, uh, there were three objectives. And uh, one of the objectives was to create a platform for training in epidemiology and others. And I still remember in one of the slides, you know, it was explicitly written that we wanted this to happen so that in future, it would serve as a training opportunity. And what Archana is doing now is exactly like that. As several of our master's students are doing. And now I think there are some Fulbright, like US students are coming. Lots of things happening now. 